so hi everyone. Uh, I know we are kind of com coming to a close to today's sessions, but I felt that not a lot of machine learning was covered in today's session, so we kind of wanted to cover MLOps, and of course, uh, these days it's really relevant given all the rise of Gen AI and how. Of course, a lot of work is also being done by platform engineering teams and DevOps teams to adopt machine learning workloads on top of Kubernetes. And of course, our talk is not going to be di direct directly towards that, but of course, we'll be talking about a lot of different engineering aspects that you can leverage when it comes to adopting multi-tenancy inside of MLOps. And we'll understand why that is the scenario, why is that required especially when dealing with a complex set of machine learning workloads where you might be working with different type of machine learning models and how all of that kind of ties up with Kubernetes since we are, we are at Kube Day. So quick introduction. I'm Shwai. I'm an ambassador at POSMED, and with me is Rohit. Hello. Yeah. I guess I'm audible. So hello. So uh, who am I? So I'm Rohit. and. Uh, Chiwai has already introduced. So I, I run a small consultancy, which is a LS service. And uh, if you have ever been to case studies, I was also the organizer of, of one, then also community groups and a lot of things. So if you want to ask anything about DevOps Cloud Native, we can always reach out. So what actually uh, today's topic about? Multi-tenancy with MLOps, right? But first, discuss MLOps. So uh, if you have ever worked with the machine learning projects, how the traditional machine learning projects look like? So you, like most of the time, you are just playing with the data sets. If you actually worked in the uh, machine learning companies, uh, it is not just about taking the pre-trained models and done. <laughs> so you are playing the data sets, then you are uh, like fine-tuning it, you are evaluating, uh, you are running the training data sets, then you got the uh, evalu uh, evaluating training parameters and a lot of things. Then you uh, generally scale up and scale down according to your business needs and according to your company needs, right? And then there is a, a heavy testing. So it goes back whenever the things go uh, wrong and all. And uh, if you run it successfully, then you deploy. Otherwise, that pipeline runs for months and years. How, like, because I have worked in uh, one of the companies previously, which uh, is acquired by Reliance. So it was same thing there. And then monitoring and same iterating, and this pipeline works. So I think that's, that was one of the things and major pain of the data scientists. That's why the MLOps kind of a term got introduced. But MLOps was uh, in the picture from the long time. So let's see what it is. So if you see uh, our data ML infrastructure, it doesn't scale across well uh, with teams and organization. It particularly needs the different, different uh, what we say, different, uh, different things needs the different uh, teams for it. Let's say there is a team A, uh, which is a ML team, and team B is the DevOps team. So if you see here, team A is responsible for the machine learning pipelines. So they have made some uh, critical update, which is uh, we are seeing here as a uh, yeah, pipeline update, right? So unprecedentedly, they have also broke the pipeline Y and pipeline Z, which is not, require, uh, not uh, like reliable to them. It is DevOps uh, team, right? But this happens. So it was not in a manner, but this thing happened. So that is one of the thing here. So if you see, uh, team, is, uh, like team B was not uh, responsible for it, but things happen. So this is unintentional cause, and if you uh, see that, it happens every time. And that's why dedicated things required when you scale uh, across the teams. So if we move forward, you can see uh, for like different, different ML workloads, you require the dedicated infrastructure teams. So why? Let's see, uh, first is our provisioning CPU uh, and GPU memory. So every company, right, if, uh, uh, if they are working on the ML and stuff, here we are referring about how the allocation of computational resources, uh, like your CPUs, GPUs, then memory, which are critical to ML. Also, like, so that's what is required. So what is one of the theme? Then there is a framework, right? Every, every uh, machine learning models and stuff, like every uh, infrastructure suggests, like uh, Go, and used to support multiple frameworks, right? And uh, that's how uh, flexibility in development comes. Uh, then there is multi-tenancy, which is like ability to support all of the uh, multiple users or groups. 
into single instance, same, in same infrastructure without compromising your privacy and security, which is one of the important concerns in the MLOps, right? Then there is auto scaling where you don't require any particular individual to come into the picture, and uh, your infrastructure can auto scale the any ML workloads you have, ML pipelines you have, right? Then there is a cost controls, uh, spot machines, which is nothing but you have the, some spot machines, right? Then you are uh, actually like using spot instances to cre uh, specify the computational resources, so you can uh, have that strategy to control your cost and define it particularly. Then uh, model monitoring, which is nothing but you keep track of the model's performance every time, and that leads to the beneficial for the company. And also post-deployment, you ensure how the uh, like efforts to be expected in future. Uh, now, how MLOps benefits from multi-tenancy? Let's see. Uh, we explored a lot of points, right? So we are discussing about multi-tenancy. Multi-tenancy, uh, what happens here? Cost efficiency, because you just have like a uh, single instance, which is uh, having like different software stack inside it. So you don't have to worry about the infrastructure cost and licensing cost for different, different uh, uh, software previously. You're just combining everything into, into one instance. That's why platform, platform, platform engineering team everywhere, <laughs> things are <laughs> happening, right? Then similarly, type and saving. Time saving is like uh, you perform similar activities with similar software stacks and uh, that multi-tenancy eliminates uh, to switch between different stack, and you are saving the time and streamlining your workflows and everything. Then collaboration announcement, which is nothing but uh, you foster a collaboration among MLOps practitioners, so they can work on same platform, share resources, they can share whenever uh, whatever needed, they can work with the DevOps teams and all, and everything works, uh, combining the knowledge sharing and production deployments. Then there is a resource optimization. So with multi-tenancy, resources like compute power, then storage, it really optimizes So uh, because it is shared, right? Then there is a, uh, there ensures like available infrastructure is using efficiently and not reducing your, uh, uh, sorry, reducing your waste and uh, uh, time. So yeah, uh, as you can see here, uh, if you read that term, it is really hard to understand. <laughs> but we can relate it to one thing, like what actually is the multi-tenancy here for the AIML architectures. So if you see that image, uh, it is like a uh, building and it is uh, with lo a lot of uh, apartments and all, right? So every apartment will have some families, right? So families here are nothing but your, uh, let's say, your servers or nothing but uh, your uh, tenants. So, and your building is nothing but one of the environment. And so let's see, in the families, they are working, uh, they are working on something. Let's say they are cooking, they are, they are uh, doing a lot of things inside uh, their families, right? So that is nothing but your data and models, because company needs, uh, ML workloads needs the data and models to perform and all. So that we can relate with that, then there is a, Let's say you are using the computations here and a lot of things, right? So that is nothing but your uh, family using the electricity and all. Uh, then there is a, uh, another thing is like, let's say you have that, uh, 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 like AI models are deployed, distributed, and orchestrated, we say, and it is like solution is accurate, reliable, and scalable. What is this thing? So let's say, uh, in your families, uh, in, so you are going and booking the apartment and stuff, right? So which utilities will get, which apartment we will get, that is nothing but your distributions, orchestrations, deployments for your companies. And if that goes really well and stuff, that is you will perform for the accuracy and scalability for the future. Now let's discuss to the uh, one of the important point, which is orchestrators. It is game changing for sure, like you can see, uh, it is tool source system that manage everything for you. Like uh, it will contra uh, like it will contribute the logical flow for your transferring one uh, like raw state to desired state, which is process state. So how it is uh, doing that? You will see in that diagram, which visualizes uh, which shows like there are different nodes of the progression from start to finish, right? So you will see like there are workflow with different set of a task. So here you will see like retrieval, then splitting, then uh, data, 
processing, data cleaning, then various possible machine learning systems uh, you can see in the trained data and also training might be there. So everything is going from one end to another, and this use of such orchestrators is crucial in complex system. So that's what uh, is uh, efficiently ordered by the orchestrator. So moving forward, we can see uh, so what actually is the orchestrator help you in about. So first is unit, uh, units of computation you need for your workload, which is nothing but orchestrator help you to figure out uh, and manage the individual tasks or steps required to complete your data processing or computational network. Then there is uh, data flows between those units. That is like it will assist you to manage how the data is passed from one uh, of your uh, tasks to another, and then ensure the workflow is running really smoother and uh, without any problems. Then there is uh, another thing, which is what the types and state of your data is at any given point. So it is nothing but you have different types of data, right? So, uh, image and all, the, all these things, like which kind of image and stuff. So this keeps the track like how the things will move and all. So raw, processed, and stuff. Then there is a what dependencies each unit relies to do its computation. That is like it helps you identify and manage dependency, uh, which conditions or regular pro, uh, particular task it defines. Then uh, there is a, uh, we are showing containers so you can understand it. <laughs> Then there is uh, what resources each unit has available to it. So let's say uh, orchestrator also manages resources, such as like uh, memory, processing power, if you're working in the uh, ML workload side, right? computational power, then storage. So these are assigned to each task in different big workflow, right? So this, this is managed by orchestrator. Like it, it not managed, it, is, it helps you to reason about. Then. So we would like to introduce this uh, one of the open source tool, which is uh, Flight. So what actually is a Flight? Uh, you will see there are tasks and workflows. So you can easily define it in Python. So when you go to the uh, Flight documentation, you can easily download it. It's really easy to understand. Then you can uh, have that import task and workflow. So task is nothing but a uh, small kind of a thing you are defining. Let's say you want to. Uh, you want to give some instructions to the uh, robot, like go left, go right, and this thing. So that is task, right? But workflow is like asking them to go from this stage to another, right? So that is the entire workflow. So here, we are having that task and workflow, so you can define it really well. And that will help you to uh, build the entire pipeline for the, your workflow. And now, just to kind of add to this, Flight is basically an LF ANI project. So the Linux Foundation has a separate AI related, a lot of like AI related uh, projects. So it comes under the Linux Foundation. Uh, it's also similar to Kubeflow. Uh, some of you might be aware of the term Kubeflow. Yeah. Uh, that's also currently being incubated inside the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So of course, uh, all these different tools really allow you to uh, very easily manage your machine learning workloads, whether you're uh, dealing with a very simple workflow having like let's say working with the MNIST data set where you're trying to determine like what is the data set or of course you're working with a lot more complex workflows that require you to run your machine learning models natively on top of Kubernetes. So very good example is OpenAI where they are of course serving thousands of different requests with their GPT models and all of them are running on top of Kubernetes. And that is why like uh, Flight or even Kubeflow, these are Kubernetes native platforms. Uh, that means that all these workflows run on top of Kubernetes. So as Rohit also kind of mentioned about how you can basically do resource allocation and uh, task allocation with the help of your uh, orchestrators. So these orchestrators, such as Flight, are running on top of Kubernetes. And very easily you can manage what kind of pods and what kind of resources you want to allocate to these uh, particular pods. And that's what we'll be also be showing in today's demonstration. But yeah, over to you, uh, uh, over to you, Rohit. Yeah, so same thing. And if you want to use, you, you can see like there is a config file and there is the containers and all. So it's, it is easy, easily integrated and it's just an MLOps platform kind of a thing where you can use it really well. And you have the Kubernetes cluster for workflow uh, execution. So you can define that flow. I will also like to mention you like what is a uh, task. And uh, so you can see here like task, which is nothing but containerized and virtualized. And you have like uh, strongly typed input and outputs you can get whenever you are defining it. 
similarly for the workflow it is not, nothing but a bunch of a task and and you are defining how that will work and data flow will work then moving forward you can see here uh, so task and workflows are there so whenever you are writing in python code you will see like you just have to anode that uh, your code uh, wherever you can see the task or whenever you see the workflow. So what is here? So you can see in total spend, it is just a sum, right? You are doing the sum. But calculate spend is like multiplying that sum and to get some output, right? So that is your entire workflow. So you need to annotate really well, like task and workflow. And yeah, it uses various data frames, PySpark and Python data uh, types, and you can use it. Execute locally. You can try it on any cloud providers, whatever you need. And yeah, if you want to enable caching, yeah. And just to kind of, if you can probably go back one slide, um, just to kind of also give a very good example is, so of course, some of you might be, if you're working with Python, we are, of course, using decorators. So it, it has a similar syntax uh, to how you would kind of declare your decorators inside of Python. And another example that I think we can probably quote over here is, so let's say if we take an example of a typical machine learning lifecycle, starting off with cleaning your data, and then, of course, moving towards data processing, and then applying your machine learning model. So each of these particular steps inside of your machine learning cycle can be attributed as individual tasks. And your entire workflow would be a sequence of these particular tasks that can run parallelly. So imagine that if there are multiple teams, you can define different set of workflows. And each of these workflows can have a number of different tasks. And of course, like it's totally up to your team on how you want to define multiple tasks and how all of them incorporate these different tasks. And that's what uh, Rohit will basically share in the next slide. Yeah, so you can see here. So if you have worked in the machine learning traditional methods, so you can see like there is a ETL, data ETL extractions and stuff you do. Then there is a classification model, forecasting model. There are different types of models, right? Which is nothing but the projects you are using. Then there is the domains, which is nothing but different type of environment, which is development, staging, and production. So you can see here, it is just a logical group of task and workflow for built-in multi-tenancy and isolation, which is uh, showing as a projects. And domains is like uh, providing specific environment to execute your workflows. So you can see like development, staging, production. Like if you are here, then you know these terms. <laughs> so you have heard from it long, long time and all. So mul flights, multi-tenancy starts with like projects and domains. So you can see here like there is no need for like separate environment. So how we will see it in some time, and there is like uh, you will see. Uh, like how the models may need to be used or worked upon by several teams with organizations. Then single ML pipeline can be compromised with several com uh, components, each assigned to them. The teams and then team members can go, and uh, they will be able to share the files and collaborate and stuff. So everything comes under the like, flight multi tenant ground or something. So uh, yeah, then I will like to uh, move on to Shiva, and he will present you the demo. Thank you. And I think like one point that I want to quickly mention is that Flight's infrastructure was actually inspired by AWS. So we know that AWS is very huge in the entire uh, in the cloud ecosystem. So of course, what AWS allowed you to do is have a single infrastructure, but still be able to manage different aspects of your uh, overall cloud native experience, whether you're just using EKS or ECS for deployment, uh, using Kubernetes, or you're using something like load balancers or spot instances to manage your workloads in terms of like how you can do load balancing. But of course, uh, it, provo it provides something like IAM support where you can have like different people working on specific parts. So AWS in, in itself kind of inspires a lot of like multi-tenancy uh, inbuilt inside that particular platform. And that's what like Flight and as we'll kind of give you a demonstration now, uh, how it kind of incorporates that multi-tenant features directly inside of the uh, platform itself. And again, like you're, you're not just limited to Flight. You can use any other orchestrator platform like Kubeflow uh, that also do provide multi-tenancy out of the box. But yes, uh, over to the next slide. Uh, so of course, we'll now kind of cover the main aspects of uh, flight that kind of are inspired by multi-tenancy. So the first one is resource isolation or resource sharing. Now, let's imagine a place where, like, let's say you have two different type of teams. One is the DevOps team, and one is the machine learning team. Now, of course, uh, when it comes to the ML team, they're doing a lot of like data pre-processing, and they're running these huge machine learning models that would require you to uh, have 
larger compute, for example, using GPUs in order to train these models, whereas DevOps teams might not require that much amount of compute because they are mainly just using that particular model that has been generated or that model artifacts that have been generated by the machine learning or data science team, and they'll just use that for deploying that particular project. So um, out of the box, you get very nice support for being able to isolate your resources. So as Rohit kind of, come, uh, kind of shared, that uh, Flight has this entire architecture of having different projects. Now, these projects are essentially, uh, you know, you can think of like two different teams, Team A, the data science team, having their own separate project, and the, uh, the Team B, which is like, let's say, the MLOps team, having their own set of project. And each of these projects are basically comprised of different workflows and tasks. So team A, which is the machine learning team, will have a bunch of different tasks that they are only wanting to use. So all the resources and um, all the memory that will be isolated to them. And again, since this is working on a Kubernetes level, because it's a Kubernetes native platform, so basically with, whenever you run any task inside of Flight, it basically generates a new Kubernetes pod. And um, it will have, of course, the namespace that gets generated will be just limited to that particular project and that particular task that you're running it on. So you get native support for isolation at that particular task level as well. So of course, like this is one example where we have team A with running one kind of workflow which has like multiple tasks, and then you have a workflow for team B. They are having a separate workflow with themselves. Uh, you could also probably have multiple workflows if you have a much more complex architecture. So if you want to kind of demonstrate this now, let me quickly open up my, uh, my VS Code to kind of just quickly demonstrate this particular aspect. And uh, let me just go over here. So you will be, be able to probably see um, that if I go to this particular teamA.py, and I'll just quickly also zoom in my uh, screen. So let me know if is everyone able to uh, see this, right? So over here, I have basically two different files. One is teamA.py, and the other one is teamB.py, if you're able to see it inside the workflows directory. Now, of course, uh, team A is, let's say, a data science team that is using the Wine data set. They will basically use binary classification to detect what kind of Wine there is. So we have defined different tasks, such as for fetching our data, for processing our data, and then we have a task for training our model. So here we are just using some basic machine learning uh, steps that you'll do in a typical uh, data science life cycle. And then, of course, we have workflow, which will basically uh, be used to train our uh, data set on uh, using logistic regression as one of our machine learning models. Uh, similarly to this, we'll also have a team B. Um, in this example, we have basically used the same uh, ki kind of code. But imagine that this particular team B, which is like a separate team altogether, they might have um, you know, probably some other workflows. For example, like deploying the, that same particular code that you used. They will probably have some steps related to, uh, related to deployment. Now, uh, the flight uh, UI will basically show you two different type of projects that we have created. So if I click on our flight, you can see that I have basically created two separate projects over here. Uh, so the first project is the demo data science, which will basically refer to our, uh, you know, to this particular uh, file, which is the team a.py. So you can basically define uh, one particular uh, project. So what I did behind the scenes was that for this particular team a.py, which is one workflow, I assigned it to the particular project, which is the team. Um, and let me just navigate back to over here. So one second. OK. Uh, perfect. Yeah, so that is for data science uh, team. And then the other demo, which is the team B, is for the demo team MLOps. Now what I can do is I can run workflows directly from my local machine. And I can run these workflows that are isolated on a project level as well. So for example, I'll just quickly uh, take up one particular line where I'm going to be running these particular workflows. And I'll go back to my terminal. And I'll run this particular command. So over here, let's do one thing. And let's run. So what you'll see is, if I kind of zoom in a bit more, uh, the command that I'm running is pyflight run uh, hyphen p. Hyphen p basically stands for the particular project. And then I'm also defining that it, will sh it should only run for team A. So 
And then I'm also giving it the domain. So I can define whether I want to run this particular workflow inside of uh, my, in, you know, my development environment, my staging environment, or my, or my production environment. And as soon as I run this particular workflow, what it will do is uh, it will generate that particular workflow. And I can actually visualize that particular workflow right over here in my UI as well. So in this case, um, let's just wait for it to load. Um, so now it will basically execute that particular workflow. And as you can see, that it, it is only happening in, in that particular uh, project that is for team A, uh, that's inside of the, you know, the data science demo. And then it runs all these particular uh, different tasks that are there as an execution. You can also like, visualize it through DAG, which is basically being used inside of Flight. So it helps you to kind of visualize the different uh, you know, domains and the different uh, tasks and how they are interconnected with, you, e with each other. So a DAG representation also allows you to visualize your complex machine learning workflows very easily. right? And of course, all of this, the great thing is that all of this is running natively inside of Kubernetes. So if you want to kind of get more information about that, let's say if I want to just take a look at my task, which is get data, I can actually look at my Kubernetes logs. And that will basically show you how we were able to generate a particular namespace that is just uh, specific to that particular workflow that we have just run. So over here, if I quickly show you all the different pods that I'm running, uh, the latest pod that I just ran, which is basically in the staging environment, was, was for that particular uh, task that I just ran. And this particular pod that I have just in instantiated will only be limited to this particular task. And all the different team members or users which are part of this particular project and uh, this particular workflow can only access it. So I can define role-based role access as well at a task level, at a workflow and a project level as well to provide you that kind of isolation. Because you don't want the MLOps people to interfere with the workflows that are being run for the for the data science people, right? We don't want that to happen. So you get isolation at the pod level as well. And of course, if you take a look at, carefully take a look at any of the na any namespaces that we generate, right? So the namespaces that you uh, see, for example, uh, team A demo production. So basically, your namespace gets generated from the project and the domain that is like whether you're running it in the production environment, the staging environment, or in the development environment. So all of that is natively supported over here. Now, if I go back to the resource sharing aspect, right? Um, we can also actually do task sharing. For example, one workflow would be that, let's say, your team B relies on the model artifacts that you generate from team A. So you can basically reference tasks from one team to another team when you explicitly define that. Because by default, you don't get that capability out of the box. Because every team is working in, in their own res resources because, of course, because of communities, like we are generating that RBAC control. But if you want to explicitly, like, let's say, team A uh, is working on the design team, they generate a model. Now you want to deploy that model. So like, you could basically refer to one of the tasks that is generating the model and use it inside of your team B, where you will basically use it. And again, like one such example, I'll quickly just go back to our uh, project over here. So one such example is over here, where basically in our team B, uh, we are referencing to a particular task that's from another project. So imagine that this project is generating, this particular task is generating your machine learning model artifacts that you want to use to get deployment. So you, you could basically do that. Uh, so that's one another aspect that you get with uh, Flight of being able to share tasks across different projects. Uh, of course, another thing would be restricted access with respect to RBAC. So of course, you can define roles and role, binding, role bindings so that you enforce RBAC control uh, natively inside of your different projects and different, uh, you know, uh, different workflows. And then, of course, you can also define GPU and CPU requirements. So for instance, like let's say on a CPU level, like let's say one particular task is a machine learning task, you can assign explicitly assign uh, GPU resources and CPU resources to that particular uh, task as well. And apart from that, you can define resources on a task level as well. So for example, one such example would be, uh, and I'll just quickly show you because we are running out of time. So for example, you can define, uh, while defining a task, you can also define a pod template as well. That when you execute that particular task, what that particular unique uh, pod should look like. So in this case, we're defining a pod spec to ensure that we basically put some limitations on what resources and what type of GPU you want to assign to that particular task. So all of this gets natively implemented inside of Flight. So that makes it very easy for MLOps teams to work 
inside of a single platform, as Rohit mentioned, that you don't need separate platforms for your data science team working on your Python lab notebooks. All of that can be handled easily inside of one infrastructure team and that with one particular platform itself. Uh, so of course, you get resource isolation as well. And you can actively like, do declarative, uh, declarative syntax or declarative infrastructure provisioning as well with the help of Flight. But yeah, uh, I, I know we are sort of out of time, but you can connect with us and we'll be open to questions. And if we don't get time for questions, we can, of course, connect after uh, our talk. Thank you. Thank you.